We are making core decisions for the spine of every single industry, as well as our human communication that do not replicate anywhere near the average or mean life experience. You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, Sarah Box. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners, welcome back. I'm Sarah Box, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, where we're on a mission to help individuals, teams, and organization think outside the box move beyond limiting beliefs and create a profound impact in their own lives and sometimes even in the lives of others. And we do this by sharing accomplished and inspiring guests who have challenged their own limiting labels and beliefs to pursue, accomplish, and overcome challenges and achieve their personal and professional goals. And today's guest is no different. We've been doing our pre-chat thing which I should have just kept as an interview because it's been fun and great. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest. I'm excited to introduce you to Nicole Trick Steinbach, and I'm only going to call her Nicole or maybe Steinbach going forward. But um, (laughs) Nicole is an international bravery coach and a former tech executive who's worked in over 25 countries. She's bridged cultures and continents. Um, And she understands that bravery isn't always a natural trait, but a skill that can be cultivated. And she's made it her mission to help women in the tech industry build their own brave careers, reduce stress, work smarter, and achieve higher earnings. And she is the host of the Celebrate Brave podcast, where she shares insights and inspiration to encourage women worldwide. So get ready for an insightful conversation on in unleashing your inner bravery with our incredible, incredible guest. Ooh, baby. Um, too many syllables for me on a Friday. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to, I do want to mention before I bring Nicole on formally that even though she focuses on tech, I will tell you that our conversation is not limited to that. And if you stay tuned, you'll find out why. So welcome, Nicole. Oh, I'm so excited to be here and join so many incredible guests that you've had in the past. Oh, sweet. Well, I want to start by saying that you mentioned you are not naturally brave. So what does that mean and what changed for you? Oh, yeah. So I am definitely not naturally brave. So I even had a period of um, life where I got offered, I, you know, I grew up really poor and I needed money. I was in college. College in the U.S. is very expensive. And I was offered to get paid to jump out of flying airplanes. They call that skydiving. I call that ridiculous, right? And so I think that there's where it's a really great place to start because we've been conditioned that being brave is taking these massive physical leaps, right? Like running into a burning building or going to war or jumping out of airplanes. And if that is something that interests you, Bob's your uncle. Do that. That's very exciting. I will cheer for you from very, very, very far away. Probably won't watch the video recording. Anywho, brave is actually the small moments, the big moments that bring us closer to who we want to be, how we want to be, and what we want to experience or not experience. So in my case, I wanted to experience stability. That meant going to school. That meant taking a lot of risks. That meant saying yes before I wanted to or I thought I was ready. As an example in my career, I was a consultant before I knew what a consultant was. Like, I did not know there was a job called consulting. I signed up to be a technical writer. My colleague got sick. I was already living in Germany. Spoiler, I moved to Germany for 13 years. And my colleague got sick and someone needed to go up to Norway. And yes, I'm in. They gave me a printed binder so that we all know how old I am. Because we didn't carry laptops. Are you kidding? They could be broken or lost. So I went up there with a printed binder, came back, and was introduced as the newest consultant. Like, that is great, right? And so when it really started to shift for me is when I started 
to experience change management as a function. Like before that, I was just moving away from things, moving away from poverty, moving away from being underpaid, being a, moving away from all of the other challenges that one may have in life. But when I started experiencing change management and moving towards things that I wanted to do, like be debt free, be in a healthier relationship, own my own property, whatever the case may be, have friendships of people who actually know who I am, because I hid myself for a very long time. That's when I started realizing not only is bravery a skill, like I can choose to be incrementally more brave, but I can actually break it into steps. And those steps are clarity, momentum, take action, right? And then accountability, who do I want to be? And then be that person. And so that is what bravery is to me. That's one of the key moments where I began to shift into it. And that is how I break down this thing that we've been told is an attribute. We have it or we don't. This thing that we've been told is extreme. It's not into incremental steps so that I can live the life I want to live, build the business I want to live, but also so my clients can as well. And then I'm also a parent, so I do try to bring this to my kids. They think it's ridiculous, but I do try. I do try. <laughs> They'll remember them later. <laughs> right now, you just get to be dubbed mm, crazy. You know, she has this philosophy, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's the messages are getting in. Um, so I want to ask you if you would separate the quote-unquote standard change management lingo that we use in organizations and corporations from your type of change, which to me yes. feels much more uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. And well, I, they're both important. I'm not discounting the other, but the change management you are talking about yeah. is personal where you can have personal accountability on it. And it's not banking on someone else doing their piece to have an impact. Oh, 1 million percent. One million percent. So I'm actually a certified change manager um, by through a couple of places. I worked at a multinational, one of the biggest in the world um, in tech, and I ran the area of change management. So not just a project, but like massive programs globally. That's how I worked in 25 countries. That's how I led these big teams in this matrix environment, et cetera. And we can talk about change impact. We can talk about stakeholder management. We can talk about whatever. And even then, as a global senior director, I was still saying, but what is your change? How are you leading your change? And it, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Most of the time, the biggest pushback I got was from the executives. Oh, I'm not changing. They're changing. <laughs> We're changing the process, not me. But then the other place that I got the second most pushback was on the ground level, right? Like, the people who were concretely selling the software or implementing the software, the people who were individual contributors and somewhat senior, not super senior yet, right? And I would say to them, you're right. The process is changing. Your team is changing. But, how, but what's your role here? Because we are always co-creating. So even if we use the structured certified change management language, at the end of the day, if you're working with me, we're talking about your personal change, which starts with, who do you want to be? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you having, you know, looking at it from an executive leadership role, as well as mid management, and just someone who likes to roll up their sleeves and get going. The wheels fall off when people won't say, yeah, I dropped the ball on that, because I whatever, not blame finding, but just like, who do I want to be? Do I want to be more dependable, yeah. more whatever, and own it? it? It may not even fit in with where you work anymore, and you may have to make yeah. a different decision. Yeah. So coaching was part of my full-time role, and I and I continue to notice this. And it's not true for everyone, and gender is on a spectrum, right? Yep. That being said, I noticed a really clear pattern. Men, when we talked about, you know, accountability, they were more than happy to take what worked. Ooh, that was 100% them. Nobody else did that, just them, right? And women were more than happy to take accountability for what wasn't working, especially if it wasn't theirs. Well, so-and-so didn't finish their report. That's all my fault. I was like, no, 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 no. Both of those have a place. One is like self-promotion, self-promotion, which is great. Do that. You should be selling your 
probably give credit where credit is due, but like, it's also really beneficial to like take credit for what you've created so we can learn from what I would call the patriarchal norms. And then the matriarchal norms, like the governance, right? The caring, the holistic, let's take that, but let's not turn it into blame and shame. And at the end of the day, if, if I, I have this entire thing called the accountability triangle, it's actually free. It's on my website if you want it because I care so much about this is shifting from both of those extremes into what accountability truly is, which is of, for, and with self, right? So if my priority, I get real passionate about this. You I, I totally agree with you. So I'm just loving this. I'm talking. We'll talk about, we'll go, let's just go into detail on that triangle. Yeah. Because I think accountability gets a bad rap. It's either seen as a Ugh. punitive thing or like mm -hmm. you're saying, a shaming thing. When actually it's a very liberating thing. Oh, it's incredibly liberating, right? So one of the things that's so important when it comes to accountability is just generally speaking is first, you've got to get clear that it's not governance. So when somebody says to you, oh, you're accountable for the finance team giving you numbers for the report. No, I'm not. No, I'm, not. I'm responsible for telling them the deadline, for reminding them of the deadline and for escalating, right? And when it comes to me and my life, I'm accountable. I love to call it the death, the deathbed exercise, which I've heard on your podcast before, which is like, okay, you're dying. What are you looking back on? What are your priorities? So if my priority are my children, then that comes first. Yeah. So I have to decide between, and I just had to make this decision. I got offered this really cool speaking engagement and it was paid and it was in a great location and all these things, right? I had to turn it down. My kids have things going on, so I have to prioritize. And that's not to them. It's not my job, my husband's job to keep me accountable. It's not his job to govern me into my priorities. It's mine. And so that brings us into the triangle. So the triangle in the case, and I'm going to take one that maybe a lot of your listeners would um, relate to. So you're doing a project with someone else. So at the top of the triangle is the outcome. So let's say the outcome is a weekly report, whatever that is, whether you're a business owner and you need to do your quarterly tax reports or you're employed inside of a corporation and you have to do like a monthly report. It's the report. The report has to come out. It probably has KPIs. It probably has quality standards. It has to come out. And then it branches down onto both sides. So the bottom of the triangle is just like a pyramid. It's on the ground. You are on one side and whomever it is that you need to collaborate with is on the other. Then you take a look at that and you're like, okay, we're both working towards this outcome, right? What am I responsible for? Where do I need to be consulted? What can I influence or inform other people about? And then the same for them. Okay. When you have that clarity, then you begin to see how am, how am I communicating? How am I overproducing? Am I, this is the biggest question, am I doing their job? And if so, the answer is probably yes. How and why? And then you begin the process of being the person who stops doing that. You know, so many, just a quick side note, so many women especially confuse, and I did this, servant leadership with being people's moms. Go take an actual servant leadership certification and you will be told to stop mothering or parenting your teens. So if you're feeling exhausted, you're feeling like you're overproducing, you're wondering why you're not working the hours you want to be working, but you're also working on holidays and you're working on Friday nights and you're doing that. Go check out the accountability triangle because once you have that clarity, you can begin to take the steps of don't nag people, Escalate when it's appropriate. Be clear about what's yours and what's theirs, right? And come into your accountability, which is of self. And the more, and this is one of the biggest oh, brave moments, for, I think, for us all. And I have this perpetually, and so do my clients. And I've heard your um, guests talk about this as well. Every single time that we undertake doing things or thinking about things or behaving in certain ways, feeling in certain ways, that we told ourselves we wouldn't do anymore. We undermine ourselves. So one of the bravest things that you can do is build your self-trust by building your confidence, by doing, saying, thinking, feeling, etc. Those things that you said you were going to do and you deserve it. It, it is it's such a, um, 
And I, this happens always. People, well, it's just faster if I do it. And I'm thinking, okay, but then is that the result you want? And if that's the result you want, then what you told me you wanted is out of alignment. So let's figure out how you can keep getting that same result. Well, I don't want that same result. I said, but you keep doing the same thing, right? right. Well, it's it's uncomfortable. And I said, yeah, I get it. It's Everything's uncomfortable until it's not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Isn't that the truth, right? Like everything's a little uncomfortable until you just do it enough that you're just going, it's not my favorite thing to do, Yeah. but I know how to do it. And then it becomes more habitual, right? So you're not having to think about it and go through this mental angst about it. It's like when this happens, a typical response is this. And if there's a big deal, you can pause and go, okay, Hmm. I might make an adjustment, but I don't have to. Um, That's right. But boy... It's really easy to fall into that. And you're probably right. I mean, I don't necessarily hear guys say this as much as the women I work with. It's like, but I'm people count on me. I'm thinking, sure. Yeah, of course they, they do. And they should because you've set yourself up that way. It's a nice thing that people can depend on you, but can you depend on them, right? So, I mean, it's it's really a yeah. self-respect thing. Yeah. And I mean, there's a certain element of like, but why would I? So I had an incredible, say more about that. So I yeah, so I had an incredible employee. So most of my employees, because I learned how to hack the system, I was in a matrix global environment. So I led and I managed budgets, but I didn't have to do all the human paperwork. You know, like I gave my mustard, as the Germans say, into a performance evaluation, but I didn't have to do all the all the things because I am brilliant. Anyway. So in this matrix situation, I had someone who actually literally reported into me. Okay, So we had to set her goals. We set her growth plan. I was in charge of her investment, et cetera, which was a huge growth experience for both of us. Well, I am horrible at scheduling. Horrible. I am horrible at event planning. I didn't even want to plan my own wedding. All right. I would have gone to the Justice of Peace in Germany and just said yes and moved on with my life. Right. Thank God for my, the family, right? Thank God for both sides. They were amazing. Anyway, so she was doing literally all of the scheduling. That was not her job. I had a part-time assistant. I had her like, I don't know, I had her um, 40%. So what would that be? 18 hours a week. But the person reporting to me was doing all of this. And she was getting progressively frustrated. But if she's continuing to do it, Because it's easier and faster because my assistant was 18. I was working in Germany. Most people, like a lot of people don't work full time, which is brilliant, by the way. Anyways, you know, then I don't have a problem. I'm fine. My assistant is fine. The only person who's not fine is the person who's overproducing. When she told me how angry she was, how she was working so hard, And this isn't what she wanted to be doing. I was baffled. I didn't know we had a problem. I didn't know we had anything going on. I thought we were great. I thought she was enjoying things. It was a huge moment for me. Huge. What was your takeaway, Nicole? Well, first of all, you got to speak up. And I need to speak up. I was also overproducing in another area. And I was like, oh, I, I wonder. I wonder if the CSO, the chief services officer, knows that I hate this. (laughs) So I had that conversation. But I also took into my leadership moments, and I do this now with the people who work in my business, now that I'm entrepreneurs, to say, how is this going for you? Is there anything that you're doing that you really don't want to be doing anymore? Is there an area of growth or support or training that you need? And recently, the person who's been doing a lot of my assistant work was like, actually, I'm kind of it's like, what do you want to do? I'm interested in learning X, Y, Z. Cool, because I need to check. I need to completely change my tech platform because of the new privacy laws. You want to try that? Yeah. Okay, let's go. But I'm. I learned that I have to ask, which feels scary, because if things are working for me as a leader, I would rather the boat just continue to go down the river. But again, bravery, clarity, accountability, and what kind of leader do I want to be? Yeah. And then I also have to tell people, I don't want to do this work anymore. Hey there, everybody. I want to take just a minute out of this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast to tell you that we are officially opening 
the Sandbox membership in September. So if you're not already on our mailing list, please click the link below to either sign up for the membership or get on the waiting list for the membership. And if you click the link, you'll find more information about what's included, what our plans are, and better yet, you'll be on early enough to help decide what is most important to you to experience in the first three to six months of the membership. So don't wait, click the link below and join us in the sandbox where fun happens. We get to do a little R&R, &R, little learning, support one another, and really grow and expand in ourselves, in our lives, and impact the world in a profound way. So come on over, join us. Yeah, I'm coming up on that conversation too. I got a great opportunity. I'm going to evaluate, I'm really going back to my, per like, where am I going? My, what is my clarity on, right? Because I reset all of that the last couple of months. I just thought, okay, you need to adjust um, because it's time. You're operating on older information. And then this opportunity comes up. I'm going, I'm going to look into the details of it, but I'm pretty sure it's a pass because it requires me to go in a direction that I'm moving away from, right? And it would produce income, but it's going to produce a lot of things that, and I relate to what you said with your kids, right? It's taking me away from my family, the things I've already put in play around health and all those things. And so I have to really consider if it fits my life. And, it, and it's likely that it will not. And when it came in, did you have that first like, ooh, and then you're like, hmm. Well, did you first go, hmm. I went more like that because I'm uh, like, okay. oh, you know, I just promised myself I wouldn't do these unless they were super um, simple. So because I have this aversion to unnecessary complexity and friction, I just, I don't, yeah, I just. Oh, my that. gosh. Yes. And so there are certain types of clients or projects that have that inherently built in. It's like mm -hmm. you have to do this at this level of detail. I'm thinking, well, that's eight hours that I could be billing someone and doing some impactful work, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hire an assistant mm -hmm. just for this project to track that minutia. That's so um, I think this comes with a heavy dose of that. And that was my first thought about it was like, hmm. I want to see who, and I, the gal said, do you have any questions? We're going to talk on Monday. I said, my questions really are around, like, who have you already spoken with? What systems do you have in place for this? What are your thoughts about your team, right? So I don't know if they Ooh. want me to design something and have the team do it, because um, it would also require me to spend a lot of time in the air, and I've since only done that as I choose to do it, right? So, I mean, those are big things, and I said, i give myself the weekend. I could have scheduled it for today. And I thought, no, you need some space and time to think about this. I love the confidence that's inside of, oh, I could be urgent, but actually I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to yeah. take a breath. I'm going to lean back just a moment. I'm going to human, see what my human is. And then go in. In this world where, especially as an entrepreneur, I wonder how you experience this, but it feels like everything could be perpetually urgent. Everybody. I think people foster that, right? It's like, I have to know this right now. And so I have a pretty high bar on that. It's like, is anybody going to die? Oh, I'll call an ER room, right? I'll call an ER for you if it's that urgent, right? I long time ago, I heard someone say this quote. And, it, and it's always stuck with me that your failure to plan is yep. not my crisis. Mm -hmm. It's not mine. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're on a tight time frame and you knew this was coming up, Yep. I may or may not be able to help. I'll try if I can. And if it's a fit, I don't want to just mm -hmm. take stuff on to take it on. Yeah. So I do, I've gotten better, much, much better, Nicole, over the years, because I care less about what people think of me, about me. I care more about my integrity. I'm so sorry. I apologize. My phone is on airplane and TikTok just randomly started. <laughs> I apologize. Of check and urgency. <laughs> It is on. It was like, let me show you urgency. <laughs> it's on. It's literally on airplane. I have no idea how that happened. I apologize. You know what? I don't want to go there. I still think there's just weird things that happen. You're going, hmm, coincidence? I don't think so. I've been mm -hmm. somewhere where someone has tracked it or tagged it. So um, I don't even worry about it. So let's talk about 
the urgency on entrepreneurship because it is it's a health yeah. issue. It really is a health issue as it makes mm-hmm. people panic and be in this fight or flight all the time. So yeah. how do you see it, Nicole? Well, I think, hmm, how do I see that? I see and that how in... it relates to brave because yes, I think it 100%. relates to brave. Uh, yeah, it does. Absolutely. So personally, so I'm going to start personally with a story. So one of the things that I love about myself is I fail a lot. I also get up a lot. So I'm a one-on-one coach, but we also have a group aspect because the number one word for women in STEM, the emotional word is lonely. And so my clients, the intimacy and the depth and everybody's experience is unique. And we also have a shared platform. So we're doing fail February. And so one of the ways that I failed dramatically in my everything is that I overproduced and overworked. And I was so scared that I, you said jump. I was like, I'm already in the air. Okay. So I was working I mean, it was in the time of Blackberries and there was no Wi-Fi on planes and I was essentially a global consultant and I did not count flight time because I couldn't work during the flight. That's not, that's not work time. Of course not. So counted time, is, it was well over 60 hours. And so now as a, I became an executive, quite frankly, I worked with the top line of a lot of those fortune whatever companies, right? if not directly with the big names, then with their teams. And quite frankly, they're not working much. If we count chilling and having good food as work, I'm in, okay. But if we talk about actual concrete work, they are all boundaried as can be. They are resourced as can be. Check out check out a major CEO's office. They have like four people taking care of just them, right? And so that was a really clear reminder for me. So when the more that I worked, the higher that I got, sorry, the higher that I got, the less I worked. The less I worked, the more creative and resourced I could be, the more positive feedback I got, the more teams I could build, right? And the more I could show up as someone who was an actual pleasure to work with. Because one of the stories of my life is that I was a disaster to work with. A, I didn't know anybody in corporations. I grew up poor. B, I worked for someone who was who has sent an apology note for being such a darn bully. And I thought that's how you acted in corporate. So I got sent to coaching. You're going to get fired or you're going to figure out how to be a decent person to work with, right? And that's where my whole coaching experience yeah. started. Oh my gosh, I am, I just like, I wish more women would get that type of investment because right now in the tech industry, which is the only industry I have data for, men get four times the amount of investment. And in 2019, the last year the data was available, it was three times. And so what happens is women don't get that type of investment and certifications and coaching and sabbatical, whatever the case may be, They then they don't ask for it either statistically. And so they don't know why it's important. And the skills just continue to fall back. But I got it gifted to me. I mean, I was also about to get fired. So I took it very gratefully and I figured it out. And so when I think about overproducing and being brave now as an entrepreneur, I literally have in my agreement for my consulting company, and I actually fired a big account because they couldn't figure this out, as well as in my coaching, there are no emergencies. Right. There are no emergencies. If in coaching you are having an emergency, you need to call your suicide attention thingy. You need to call your therapist. You need to call a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm a certified coach. That's it, right? And then with consulting, I'm a compliance officer and I'm not your lawyer. Get out of here. There's a reason I'm not in cybersecurity. Call someone else. (laughs) <laughs> no kidding right it's like oh my gosh you know it's not an emergency and i've worked in a lot of product teams for you know in, in consumer products and finance etc in their tech layer because the spine of every industry is tech so when i say i support women in tech guess what it's every darn industry right where and isn't it now exactly right and the product teams are often at the beginning complaint. And I tell the leadership, I'm like, your product team is going to complain about me. 
because it's going to be the first time that they've seen someone work in a project as a consultant who has boundaries. And the first, they're going to be pissed. They're going to be angry. And then they're going to start to have like, oh, oh. So your job, dear executive sponsor, is to tell them to come talk to me. Oh, Nicole wasn't available on Sunday at 2 p.m. You should really talk directly with Nicole. Yeah. Well, that's changing their behavior as well. That's right. Because that also sets the bar that, you know, the CEO or the top executive can't do that to the team. I don't know that. No, I know, but <laughs> it becomes abundantly clear. Sometimes I think the most fun thing, not necessarily in the coaching, <laughs> but in the consulting is when people come in and they'll say, well, you got to tell my board that. And I'm saying, I'll set up a situation where we can have a conversation about that. I will tell your board what the governance practices are. Yeah. Then you have to have a conversation about those. I'll, I'll even help structure the conversation. Yeah. It's not my job. Yeah. Right. Accountability triangle again. One of the most fun conversations I had as a consultant, and I'm a bit cheeky, as you can tell, I say the thing, I have a lot of fun, um, but it's, you know, a lot of therapy and a lot of coaching to get to this place. And um, so I was having the accountability triangle with the, the, person. I'm, I'm being very careful because um, I don't want to out anybody, right? Of course. And I was like, so this belongs to you. And he's like, but I don't want that. And I was like, okay, I hear you. And that, that this is, this is your job, but I don't, but I don't want to. You're much more skilled. It's like, be that as it may. This is your Bill, job. Your job. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of funny. In a, in a, and you know, actually, the further you get along in <laughs> practicing and building the resilience of these skills, the more yeah. funny it is because I can catch myself. Yeah. I can call myself out faster than anything when I'll ask someone to do something. I'm going, why don't you just be honest? You don't want to do it. If they're willing to do it, that's fine. Otherwise, get it done. Right. Or yeah. be willing to pay someone else to take it off your um, plate yeah. for you, but yeah. don't complain about it. Yeah. And one of the things that I really remind myself of often, in fact, I have it hanging right, like sort of category from where I am is I'm designing my business because to the urgency and the being brave part, you know, former executive global, I am an amazing coach. I know amazing coaches. And so I was on the path in 2021, 2022, the beginning of it to build essentially like a stable, like a stable of great coaches, right? And as I got the tech going, I had some marketing stuff going. I, I had a few people in my stable that I trust and I was getting less and less motivated. I paid for a program that was a total scam. I was just feeling gross. And thankfully, I have mentors and sponsors and my inner voice, like you said, as well as my own clients who were like, what is going on? What is going on? And I actually put a kibosh on it and I pulled everything back. Right. And thankfully I have the financial wherewithal to do that. And just exhaled and was like, oh, I am making these really detrimental, security based, unbrave, fear based, like that program I signed up for was completely fear based. Because I'm doing what I don't want to do, and that's why everything feels urgent. Yeah. What do I want to do? And I think that is one of the lessons I kind of sort of began to learn as an employee. But boy, is that become extremely clear when it's me building my business. And well, urgency. don't you find like an onion, you just get more and more clear yeah. as you circle around. You've got something else. Okay, let me go back. Yeah. My own focus that I have, the clarity. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people talk about, you know, oh, tra trade your time for dollar. What, what I, I don't even know what they say because I've decided to not listen to it. But like, if you want to run a group program, that's amazing. Please do that. That is needed. I love being in community. But if you get jazzed about going deep and exploring and knowing somebody's goal inside and out and being the extension of that, why would you set, Nicole, why would you set up a group program when that sounds so boring? Yep. Yeah. No, I've done that the same. And I just had this discussion with one of my coaches and mentors. It's like, 
this is, he says, explain your vision to me. And I'm going, oh, that really means I have to be more clear. So I'm going to tell you right now, there's a couple, there's a couple pieces. Well, there's the, to articulate what's in my head as a five on the Enneagram is not easy for me, right? It's all in there. And I, sometimes I think I've shared it with someone and they're going, no, I, this feels new. And I'm going, okay, I'll go with that. Because I've had these long internal conversations. But I said, this is the piece I want. And this is the other piece that the team wants. And we're going to work it. He goes, then what I want you to focus on is staying in your lane and building the structure you need for that to be successful, or you're going to end up doing it. I said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to end up doing it because like that, if it's not working, we will re real, we will retool and come up with something different. Um, Cause I know my lane that I really want to stay in is where I can offer the most benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really beautiful. Well, it's, 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 it's an ongoing process. You think by, and this is the thing, and I want to circle back to our pre-recording conversation, yeah. but this is the thing. People think you get to a level and you've, okay, I've, I've got my clarity, right? Okay. It's locked in. Things change. You grow, you move, life changes, and you, you need to re-examine that. But you and I, when we started, mm -hmm. and listeners, this is a conversation I frequently ask guests because the process is before they apply to be on the podcast, some time can pass, right? And so people say these are typically what folks are interested in about my expertise, which is great. But so the question I posed to Nicole was, <laughs> you know, has is there something that's been top of mind for you over the last couple of days, maybe even this morning? And she, she goes, I don't even know how this uh, relates to my topic. I said, it relates. So would you lift back up and start that conversation? Because I know it's going to relate to so many women who are in this conversation. Yeah. yeah. So I am 43 years old. In my family, we tend to mature early. And then we tend to mature early. So I am in the throes of perimenopause with the typical symptoms that one has, which there's an entire book called The Menopause Manifesto, and it is super thick. So when I say the typical symptoms, it's like a subsection of a subsection. But for a, a woman of German ancestry, which I am primarily, then that is sort of the symptoms that we tend to have. Not so much the hot the hot flashes that hasn't started yet, but just cramping, exhaustion, headache. I have exactly zero elements of patience for things, to go back to my Appalachian roots, that I done already told you. All right. I, I done already told you. Like, it's enough. Now. Did I, are we talking about your hygiene again? Brush your teeth. <laughs> Because my eyeballs are getting bigger, I think, with all the time that I am exposing them. Like, are we kidding? Are we kidding? Right. And it's so unexpected for me, but it's actually because now I've had time to think about it since you asked me. I don't like, oh, know, but that's what I'm thinking about. Um, first of all, that's brave. Just sharing because I, I don't know. Like, it was kind of like when I had a miscarriage and I suddenly discovered I knew exactly one woman who had never had a miscarriage, but we never talked about it. Yep. And suddenly I was like, oh, this is like, oh, this is life. This is an experience, right? But with menopause or par paramenopause, it's on one side for me when I am clear, I'm having all these headaches, I'm having cramps, I feel exhausted. It's being so clear that I can communicate it with someone, removing a bit of the shame of getting older. Personally, I love getting older. When I was 21 years old, I lost my birthday buddy. She was 38 years old. She was my aunt. She drove down and she died. And her, my cousin was eight years old. So every day since I turned 38, where I also had an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, just feels like a blessing. I'm in this to win this. I have plans. I'm 43. I'm not even to 50% if I get to decide, right? And so... Being clear and removing that shame, first step of bravery, right? Then I can go into momentum and I can go to the experts, but I can also talk to my elders, my leaders. I can be on the shoulders of the women and the humans who have gone in front of me, right? I can learn from the experts, like the people. That's why I joined TikTok. Full clarity. I joined TikTok because that's where we can get to the menopause researchers 
without paywalls. That's why they're there. They started in 2020. They're in Australia. I can't remember their names right now, but I can send it to you later if you'd like. Then it goes into accountability, right? I I was exhausted for 12 years. And I was told it was because I was a mom. I was told it was because I worked a lot. I was told it was because I overthink things. I was told it was all these reasons, right? I have an autoimmune disorder. I take one little enzyme every day and suddenly I don't have to sleep 15 hours. But for 12 years, doctors in three different countries ignored me, dismissed me, and I let it happen. And I'm not letting that happen this time because that's not who I am. And so bringing all of that together, now that I've thought about it a little bit, like it's just, I, I wonder, I don't know, 10 years ago, would we have even been open to having this conversation? Would I have been in a cultural moment that I would have said to you, oh, what I'm thinking about is this? <laughs> That's a great question, Nicole. I don't know if we would have been open to it. Um, first of all, the communication platforms are different, even within the last yeah. 10 years. You know, there's much more reach and access to information and things and more people who can champion you. Um, I think that's more prevalent in our online communities and that type of thing. So maybe, maybe not. But I know that it wasn't a topic when I went through it. You know, it's like mm. no one really talked about it. Some people say they were having hot flashes. I never did, right? Other than like some really like two months of severe cramping and then done. But then a woman came to, told, I'm thinking, how did she even come in, right? So we were in this golfing thing together, but she's a nurse, right? And her whole thing is talking to women about stuff like this. And so she gave these great resources about like, go to a woman or a male doctor who specializes in this, talk yeah. about hormones, talk about natural yes. things. Don't just start yes. medicating, get tested for your saliva and your blood levels, all that. She goes, don't assume what you think is happening or what people are telling you yes. is happening without further research and you can ask for that right because the insurance companies won't pay for it doesn't mean you can't ask for it yeah and i've had that conversation with my doctor too i said when you know it's time to run your annual blood panel i says great could you run for these two things here because well, i'm not seeing an indication you need i says i know he goes you might have to pay extra if insurance doesn't cover i says i know i want to know right mm -hmm. and yeah. but i think we you know it's like we're so used to like this is the norm well the norm think about it what's the norm it's the median or the middle, depending on how it's calibrated, right? And isn't that the norm of sick people or the norm of men, which often is benchmarked against, right? So Yeah, it's literally in the United States, which is different in different places. But in the United States, because <laughs> I got a little obsessive about this one time, I got real, I got I real angry it. about something. Um, the six foot half inch, did I say that correctly? Six and a half, no, six, six foot, six, one half inch, yeah. One half inch, white Christian man of slightly more than medium build who has a history in his family of hypertension and cancer, who weighs a little more than 200 pounds, and they call him Chad or Brad, depending on medical institution. So I really love to say when when this whole like overproduced capitalism, my value is based on my output. I say no, thank you, Henry Ford. You're you're well. The, you know, come on into the bus, but sit in the back, okay. And when this whole medical thing comes, and they're like, whoa, but you feel like crap, but you're you have constant headaches, but everything is in order. That's great. I'm glad that Chad and Brad are doing well, but <laughs> Nicole is not. Not so much. Well, it was an endocrinologist who told me because like I was having these yeah. weird things this was about 25 years ago. And I told my regular doc, great guy, you know, he wasn't resistant to other information. I got I'm just telling you something's off. And he goes, I've tested you for everything that seems like it could be the issue. I said, OK, well, I'm going to. So I it got some acupuncture, took care of it like that. But then part of the process was I went to this endocrinologist. 
he did some tests. He really, he's kind of was the top guy in the area here. He says, and I had to ask a therapist friend of mine to call him to get me in because he wasn't taking new patients. So he oh, did it fine. as a favor. I'm not above asking for favors. Networking, networking, yeah. networking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he said to me, he said, you're within normal range. And I said, well, that sucks. And he goes, but let me tell you what that means. He says, how tall are you? So I told him how tall I was. And he goes, what size shoe do you wear? And he goes, I will tell you for your height, there's about a two and a half size difference that you could be wearing in shoes. He says, so if I told you, here's a pair that's a size and a half different, shorter. He goes, would you put them on? I go, no, they'd kill me. He says, right. You're within normal range, but it's normal for the masses and not necessarily normal for you. That's right. And that set me free, Nicole. I just went, okay, I get to find out what's normal for me. Yep. Yep. So that was brave of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Brave. I thank you. I you know what it really is. What you were saying earlier, and I was like, oh, I'm going to snip it. You when can have it all. And when you said like it's uncomfortable until it's not. Yeah. Right. And so when I tell people, I love doing this when someone I that has known me for a long time is around, especially if they were my manager. I had a manager one time. I love this guy so much. Um, he told me I was dangerous when I was bored because I am naturally curious. Mm. I am naturally motivated. I naturally want to understand. I naturally, like all those things are natural. But I love saying when people who've known me for a good long while, I love saying, oh, yeah, I'm not naturally brave. And they just always look at me. and I'm like, but listen, it's a skill. Right? I'm not a natural skier, but I can ski. I'm not a natural swimmer, but I can swim. I'm not a natural whatever artist, but I've I've practiced the art, right? And so I've practiced being brave. Yep. And that's why now I can say, yeah, I am brave. I am absolutely brave. It's a skill I built. Well, and... I think what I liked is that you redefined what how you de- define bravery, yeah. because like you started in the beginning, you talked about we normally associate it with these massive right. overhuman accomplishments, right? Or things where people go, oh, that was great. You did this. It's a one time event, right? All you have yeah. to honestly, some of the brave things people do, all they could need to do is get liquored up and they could do it, right? Uh, it's. Um, yeah. I mean, the first time I saw cocaine was because somebody wanted a promotion. That's how they were dealing with it. Cocaine to get up, barbiturates to get down. And that is way more common than we would wish in many different industries, right? It's like, I bravely decided that that just wasn't, not not the drugs, but like the move to always have more and more and more and more right. wasn't going to be a part of my journey, even though, yes, I want to have wealth. Yes, I want to have free time. Yes, I want to have a cool title. That's why I call myself the International Bravery Coach, because why not? Well, you get to make yourself whatever you want. (laughs) Actually, can I tell you a really fun story? I actually love this story. I like fun stories. Okay, cool. So I was was in a brand new section of a company. It was a multinational. It was the first time that they had built this really important aspect of their organization. And I was the first person to come in who was going to be something along the lines of what we would now call change management. I was also pretty young. A lot of other people were young as well. And they were they were coming into new roles as well. Very few were hired from outside. Most people were a, a girl from within. And they started giving themselves these like really just like audacious, hilarious titles. Like um, secondary vice president of yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew that in the HR system, they were not a vice president. I knew they were like a senior manager or something. Do you know what I mean? So I decided to have a little fun. And so I put underneath my name, which is where people can just randomly name themselves, whatever they want. I put a capital Q, a small O, a capital S, then an ampersand like for an and, and then a capital L. And I just waited, just waited. And finally, someone was like, quality of software and, and I just, I just, because quiet is your best friend, right? So it's just quiet. Just waiting. And they're like, what does your title mean? I said, well, so I, I thought since we were just naming ourselves whatever we wanted, I could be the queen of sweetness and light. I love it. 
Well, and isn't that an ironic name considering prior to being sent to your first coaching experience, that was not you. Well, and that's why. Because oh, I, did? oh, yeah, no, I was not bringing sweetness. I was bringing data of why they needed to change their internal processes and get rid of some upper management that was behaving extremely poorly. Oh, that is such a great thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think just taking ourselves a little more lightly is great as well. You know, yeah, and when when we wrapped up that whole area and most of us started to deploy out because we were kind of like tiger teams and we would get things going and we would then deploy into other areas. Um, we had this summary, what what worked, what didn't work, what are our best practices, like a retrospective. Mm -hmm. And one of them said what worked was Nicole deciding to name herself Queen of Sweetness and Light and getting us all back down onto the floor. And it's like, yeah, anytime I'm here for you. <laughs> that is so good. So I want to check with you. Um, yeah. And you are offering, you already mentioned this, that on your website is the triangle, the accountability yeah. triangle. That's an offer for free. Yeah. Um, people can check you out on your Celebrate Brave podcast. See, I'm thinking about the alliteration on that trips me up because I have gotten lazy on my enunciation. <laughs> oh, I know that as my husband says, what, we're having what for dinner? I go, I'm not even talking about dinner, right? Because <laughs> I'm lazy. That's I'm just hilarious. Going, yeah. Well, yes. lazy, yeah. lazy gets you different results when you're thinking about talking. But, but it shows you who's listening. It's it listening. It's, I just, oh, that's a good one. I was, I was just testing. Are you paying attention? <laughs> it's fun. like I said, you got to take yourself a little less serious. Um, but as we wrap this up, mm -hmm. what do you wish I had asked you that I did not that we should put it here? Why do women matter in tech? Let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And I would, I would say because I'm a woman in tech and I am a white woman, um, I was raised in a Christian environment as well. You know, I would even say like, why does everyone matter? And the first thing I would start off with is just acknowledgement that if we look at just sheer numbers, okay, like no value judgment, just numbers. What we have created the norm of just like Chad and Brad, right? is actually a micro, micro, micro identity in the global world. That means the vast majority of people who engage with technology, and it's everyone, yeah. right? I mean, I'm sure we could find someone who's never engaged with technology and blessings to them. But like for the majority of us, we are not that micro, micro, micro identity. And so what happens when, you know, 92% of leadership positions on a global scale, meaning they have global responsibility, are that micro identity of straight white man. We are making core decisions for the spine of every single industry, as well as our human communication, that do not replicate anywhere near the average or mean life experience, right? So when we begin to think about diversification on gender, already we're having really big shifts. For example, tech runs on tables. Tables make sense, but tables turn into squares. Squares, like right now we're on Zoom and we're looking at each other in a square format. Square formats begin to close down certain parts of our connective brain. We have to do work to remain open and connected. It's obvious that you and I have done a lot of work to remain open and connected when we're in a squared situation. Research shows us that if we have more flexible forms, more people can remain connected, vulnerable, creative, et cetera. But we're not going to get there if we have 72% of all developers and designers are straight white men, which again, micro, micro, micro identity. There are more women in the world. There are more, quote unquote, not whites in the world, right? And there are more people who have more types of gender or sexual orientation, whatever that may be, whether it's polygamous, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So when women matter and when it's not about 
women acting like that micro identity, but it's about us all having a space. Tech becomes, yes, messier in the decision making process, but it actually becomes more profitable longer term. And research shows that potentially it could be less harmful because tech has a lot of quote yeah. unquote unintended consequences, right? But it could be less harmful if we're willing to think longer term. Guess who thinks longer term statistically? Women. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So women really do matter and not as a way of me acting like a man, but of us all having space at the table. And then, and then we really need to talk about intersectional identities because as a white woman, a lot of the things that work for me because I'm closer to power don't work for my black, indigenous, and brown, which are the minority of the world, sisters and brothers, right? And siblings overall. So that is something that really sits on my heart. That's why even though I could be supporting anybody, and I have, especially in my career, most of the people assigned to me as a coach when I was inside of a corporate structure were men, young men. Right? I could be supporting everyone with the skill of bravery for their career so that they stress less, right? And then work less. And then eventually they begin to earn more. But I want to support women in technology, women in STEM, because we are the spine, but we're shut off. And we started this. So I'd like to have it back, please. <laughs> give it, give it, give it back. I, when I think about those things, I always remember like the conversations on the playground. Hey, that's mine. Give it back, right? Yeah. Or yeah. take it back, right? Just yeah. you're done. That's Our right. turn. And that's I think right. about it. I know that um, when you're talking about the unintended consequences, I think also. I mean, I know women can know all the tech and all that stuff because mm -hmm. the women I know who are in that field are brilliant, right? Yes. Yeah. I love that they are, but I also think some of the platforms would operate differently. Very differently. Yeah. I mean, when it's I'm asked, really like if someone says, would you evaluate our software on this? Cause I'm a client and user and I say, I'm happy. It's like, yes, this would be much more helpful if this were upfront, right? Yeah. I can intuit my way through most things, right? But don't bury it and don't make it complex. I'm, you know, I'll Google it. How do I do this? I'm thinking, well, that is not anywhere intuitive. Yeah. You know. And I, I, I I'm, 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 I want everyone to take a grain of salt with this. What I'm about to say because it changes. The algorithms change all the time. And I'm talking about research that was completed, I believe, in 2021. So it's outdated, but it is helpful. Instagram, their algorithm showed more and more negative impact specifically to preteen and teen and young women around body image, around self-confidence, et cetera. There was a direct correlation. I'm not willing to say causation, but there was a direct correlation to how many women were in leadership positions at Instagram or not and how harmful those algorithms were. The fewer the women, the more harmful. And when we look at controls around hate speech, doxing, right? The more women in leadership positions, the faster those things are managed and the more resources are put onto the safety of the users. And the more, the fewer that are in leadership positions, functional leadership positions, the faster hate expands on the platform. So I don't, I, if we continue this conversation, we'll keep going down the road. Oh, I love it. I, no, it was a conversation my husband and I had this morning on another topic that really this whole division between people, gender, whatever, the division, right? I said, that's going to be our ruination. We need to keep our compassion and our heads mm -hmm. about us because this isn't normal. And it is normal. And I think, oh, and I yeah. think my grandkids, the my granddaughters in in particular, mm -hmm. but um, they're very different. But they have very different body images. And I'm, but the youngest one, and I'm watching. I'm going, who the hell is sexualizing you guys so young, right? I'm oh. going, your babies. Yeah. And what is up with this makeup thing, right? And it's like, well, I have to fit in. 
So I'm not a parent. I get to be yeah. back where I go. And I can talk about my concerns with my husband. We do not butt in. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I do pay attention because I'm thinking, you know, that I've seen that yeah. go the wrong way. So yeah. I'm yeah. so glad you're doing the work you're doing. Thank you. Oh, so Thank important. You. Yeah. And I, I and I agree with you on the compassion element. It's so important to know, like, perspectives and and more important most importantly i think it's to listen to the people who have been traditionally and continue to be silenced right or shoved off into the sides not writing the histories like listening to those experiences and then having our feelings in our little journals is a really big deal right because you know what feels like actually i'm just going to pull out the quote what feels like oppression to the privileged is actually more equality. Not equity, not inclusion, just equality. Yeah. Right. And I know that when I compete on a completely open market, whatever that may be, art, career, parenting, whatever, right? And it's everyone. I know that I'm average. But if I artificially remove tons and tons and tons of people because of their identity and their historical, where they were born or whatever, I know that I go up because there's fewer people competing. So let's all just have like enough confidence to enjoy learning and listening and competing, collaborating maybe with more people. That would be amazing. That'd be really fun. Yeah, I remember someone, I was in a meeting and someone says, well, you know, she being the person leading the organization always the sharpest knife in the drawer and i went well then the drawer is too small yeah honestly yeah Mm -hmm. you know the drawer is just too dang small if you're the smartest person in the room you're in a small room you know get with other people and it's a rich experience you know Mm -hmm. to be with people who don't speak your language i mean there's just all sorts of benefits about it and it it can be humbling often is right but if you stay curious and go, gee, I wonder, you just yeah. might be surprised by the bravery others have had to exhibit just to show up. Yep. Yeah. Let's I leave know. it on that note. So, Nicole, you know, normally I ask the guests on our podcast if they have listened to a previous episode and if they can share both the name of the episode, the person and some nuggets they took away. Did you get a chance to do that? Oh, heck yes. Okay. So first of all, I got a little hooked. I think I listened to like 35 different episodes. I was also training for a half marathon in my defense. Okay. But the two that I want to do a shout out for episode 307 with Dr. Marianne Mercer and the content specifically around the inventory of words. Beautiful. Now I knew about this, but the way that Dr. Mercer explains it such a good listen and I really recommend everyone to go back and do an inventory of your words I started doing this in my parenting and I realized that part of my conflict with my children was that I kept being like well if you could when you have a minute oh pick up your dirty socks please thank you okay and then number two episode 241 with I I'm, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced this um, Amaya, Amaila, maybe? Night. Love is the key is the name of the episode. And the way that she talked about her transformational shift when she went from chasing the approval of her family, who obviously, I mean, for me, it sounds like they love her incredibly, but they just think differently. They experience differently. And she started to bring that insight into her self trust and self confidence. I talk about that as like insourcing because in tech, we outsource a lot of stuff. And I say like, we can't outsource our self-trust. We have to insource that. Great episode. It's also really short. It was only like half an hour, but oh, the way, the way that she talked about that was just incredible. So go listen to those episodes. I would recommend folks, you listen to both of them. I remember both of those interviews. They were great. Um, And Amalia. Oh, thank you. Amalia. Um, Thank you. No, I thought she shared some interesting things I wasn't anticipate learning. 
from her. Mm, very genuine, really good. So we will let both of those individuals know when we clip out and share with them that you gave them shout outs on the podcast. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Thanks. Beautiful. Nicole, I want to thank you for being a guest. And seriously, listeners, if you have loved listening to Nicole as much as I have, please like and rate this episode, but share it with someone else who needs it. And if you know a young person or a not young person who is in tech, be sure to share it with them. Send them Nicole's way. Learn what you can from it Um, because tech's not going away. Mm -hmm. I believe we need women in leadership to to save the planet, honestly, Um, and in communication and collaboration. So... Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic business coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. Please remember to read, leave a five-star review, and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Till next time. Keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.